going to be is not to tell you about China. There's various reasons I don't want to do that. One reason is I have been uh, horrified to see in the crowd a number of actual China studies experts. And this, is, this is what you don't want to see when you're a journalist uh, talking about China. But I see a number of them there, so I'm going to sort of adjust my remarks in the just a casual observation fashion. I know there are also a number of people who have, are, uh, who have spent much more time in China than I have, than I have or much deeper in the language, and so on. Um, more fundamentally, I think the more anyone here is familiar with China, the more we all realize how impossible it is to talk about China. We can talk about the little parts that we have seen and experienced and try over the years and the decades to put those together in some kind of mosaic. It's a matter of just approximating day by day. So what I'm going to do instead is to talk about several ways of thinking about how we would deal with China these days. And I think this will become clearer as I, as I go along. I'm going to try to suggest several institutional perspectives, parts of the American institutional structure which have different bearings or dealings one way or another with the China of today and tomorrow, and what we can observe and be puzzled by and be certain about in the way these institutions interact with China now, what they tell us about. And the ones I'm going to talk about are first, my own native institution of the press. I'm not going to give you press critique of, of news coming out of coverage, uh, coming out of China. It, instead, what I'm going to do is to suggest what it is about the things we do and do not know in our normal American dealings about China and what that tells us about the possibility and the limitations of the professional press corps in conveying a full sense of this complicated country. So I'm going to talk about the press. Then I'm going to talk about an institution I'll define as the state or government. That is, how we should think of the general condition of relations right now between China and the United States and what, uh, what lies ahead. And I do that not, because, not to have a sort of worthy and tedious uh, China and America, a troubled future type of talk, but rather to say there are some questions which have been uh, more on people's minds in the last six months than probably in the previous five or six years about this relationship its foundations, its possible threats. And I'd like to give you my sense of what is known here, what's not known, and how we, uh, we deal with those certainties and uncertainties. Third, I'm going to talk about the institution of schools, including this particular school, and how to think about educational connections between China and the United States and what that implies in the longer term. And fourth, in a brief and yet uplifting coda, I will talk about uh, the institution of students or the student body and how if one were either a student oneself right now or the parent or uncle or grandparent or relative or friend or teacher of a student, how one might prepare this person for a future in which China is certain to be a factor one way or another. So that is the plan and then we'll have time for questions and discussions when that is done and I only would ask that if any of the known experts, I'm going to assume most of you to be known experts, but if you known experts have questions, you can be gentle. And again, remember, I'm just, I'm just a reporter, so I'm just telling you what I'm saying. So with that prelude, let me talk first about what I mean by mentioning the press and the question of public knowledge in the outside world about China. I was amused to hear uh, Stephen Barker say he'd just gotten back from China and you could tell he was already sick. I've been back long enough to be sort of better, but still I have to drink a little bit of water so I don't start uh, rasping, rasping too. The reason in introducing the subject of the press and what we know about China, the, the introductory, the, the, the light motif I suggest is the reason I enjoy being a journalist. I know there are a number of you here who are journalists too, who are reporters, is fundamentally not because I have to write about things. I don't like writing. I don't like actual writing, as most people I know who are journalists don't. And not uh, because I, I enjoy being in such a vibrant and strong and economically uh, promising industry. <laughs> but, but rather that the, the fundamental exercise that I'm going through wherever I go in the world is wondering what I know by seeing something myself that I didn't know before I went there. That's basically the question I think most people who like being reporters are always trying to answer. What do I know when I see it that I didn't know um, before? In, in a way, that's self-indulgent and tautological because presumably if you've read everything that other people had done in the same vein, then you would have, you would have uh, uh, had a pretty complete understanding. But still, 
it's impressive that, that there are areas of experience where there's not that great a gap between what you thought before and what you actually see. And there's areas where there's quite a large gap. And in my range of experience, one of the largest gaps was when it came to China. The experience of being there for a number of years and how just the feeling of it day by day differed from what I thought by reading pretty seriously books and magazine articles and newspaper stories over the world or over the years and having been first in China in the mid 1980s when uh, my family was living in Japan we took some trips to China then and as I started to think more systematically about what I was surprised by or what I didn't know before we were actually living there and trying to do business on the streets each day and travel around the country and make friends and, and, and explain ourselves, I started going through a list of things which were surprising mainly, mostly in a positive direction, not all, but mostly in a positive direction, and mainly in sort of muddying up the picture that many people would have of China based on the, say, the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games, where you have a billion hearts beating as one and everybody doing what they're supposed to at all the, the same time and, and all the rest. And instead, the kinds of things that were surprising to me, and I tried to explain over the months to readers of the Atlantic and, and in my, my books, were, for, for example, how many different countries what we refer to as China actually is how it's more useful most of the time to think of it as dozens of, prom, uh, dozen, dozens of provinces and hundreds of big companies and thousands of contending interest groups of one kind or another and a billion plus very vividly individual people and 55 or six uh, famously registered minority groups and all the rest that if you thought about it as a country, there were certain things that were revealed and certain things that made sense. We can talk about this later on. But if you thought of it as a continent or as a uh, subsection of humanity or as a big melange or something else, you would much, uh, you have a much more accurate sense most of the time of what was happening, what you knew, what you didn't know, how different things could be in one part of the country from another, how many passions were animated uh, in regional rivalries and all the rest. That's something which didn't often come through in things I had read day by day in the press. I was similarly, the longer I was there, the more I was impressed by how many of its own challenges China has, which are sort of passed away or, or uh, without the same seriousness in most Western reports. There was an aphorism that somebody told me near the end of my time there, which I thought was marvelously clarifying. This was a person who said, whenever Americans in particular, or the outside world, think about China, they always multiply whatever they're talking about by 1.3 billion. Oh, the demand for raw materials, oh, the production, oh, the humanity, oh, whatever. Whereas those in charge of China have to think of everything divided by 1.3 billion. You know, opportunity and space and income and everything else, you know, that, that's the world of, of constraints they're, they're living in. Um, there are people in this audience I know who've written at great length about many of these constraints uh, and the problems that Chinese leaders have, whether it's environmental or water shortage or pollution or regional unrest or extremities of income or challenges to the long-term development of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. You sometimes see these things alluded to in outside coverage of China, but, but they're not sort of the emotional heart of what we normally read uh, about China. Again, this was different as, as we were living there. Um, there the, the very sharp striation, almost geologically, by generation within China, depending on whether people lived through the Japanese occupation or the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution or the one-child policy, that is vividly clear almost, almost every day in China and is, is less uh, frequent uh, subject of, of comment or, or discussion um, overseas. I have a long list of these other things which I learned and tried to explain by, by, by being there. And I'll just tick off two or three of them and then what I tried to infer institutionally about why it is that we see things through these, these, uh, the, the, this, this lens. Um, probably, Probably the most important of these surprises was how much, how much less intimidating and frightening China considered as one entity seemed, at least to me, up close than it had been to read about over the years. Partly because of the, just the vividness of the individual people, partly because of all the limitations you can see to its own momentum.